Sunday night. It was usually Sunday night. When I was a boy, my dad would leave the sitting room and he would go into his bedroom. And I started following him to see what he was doing. And I would go down the hallway and peek around the door and look into my dad's bedroom. And he would be kneeling down, not praying, unfortunately, but he'd be kneeling down at his bed. And there'd be bags on top of the bed. And I would watch my dad take all the notes, the money, out of all these bags and count them one by one. And he would count them carefully and tenderly and lovingly. And sometimes he would do a second count again. And this would happen almost every Sunday evening because my dad had businesses in different places and he was a brilliant businessman. And he really counted his money, so much so that when he died, my brother found a kettle up in the attic with 10,000 euro up in it. There was a saucepan in a shed with another 10,000 euro. The man was very wealthy. That's not counting the bank money he had in the bank and all the rest of it. He made a lot of money. And my dad came from a poor family in West Cork, small farmers. They had nothing. But he really was a self-made man. And as I am older now, I began to think and wonder, what was it that drove my dad? <coughs> to put so much effort into making money? Was it the fact that his family had been poor? That was probably some of it. But you know what I think a big thing was? My dad could barely read or write. It seems about half of my family are dyslexic and the other half of us are bookworms. We love reading. But I believe my dad was dyslexic. There was no classification back then, you just weren't good at reading. But he struggled with this, and he could barely read some things, and I remember once he had to write a letter, and he couldn't write a couple of words, he really struggled. And you know, honestly, looking back, I think a huge amount of my dad's motivation in becoming successful was to prove to himself, to his family, maybe to the world, that despite his disadvantage, he was able to overcome it. And for him, counting the money every Sunday evening was proof that the man who couldn't even read or write really was making loads of money. And the guy down the road who had a degree from university wasn't making as much money than him. And this was a big motivation for my dad all the days of his life. And my dad wasn't a believer. I mean, he did have a faith, but he, you couldn't say he was born again. However, he turned a disadvantage into a big advantage in his life. I wonder if he didn't struggle with reading and writing, would he ever have had the drive and the motivation to be so successful? And I'm here today to ask you a question. What's your disadvantage? Because I promise you have one. You have something that's a disadvantage against the other people around you. And I have a disadvantage as well. And it's not just that I'm bald, hallelujah. It's a blessing. <laughs> Maybe it's the look of your face, the shape of your body. Maybe it's an addiction issue. Maybe it's a depression issue. Maybe you've lost someone and it's a wound in your soul. Maybe it's something at work. With study, I could go on and on. Maybe it's your health. But we've all got a disadvantage. And I am here as we're about to come into spring. This is the last Sunday of February. And Ireland is about to enter into real springtime this next month. March is a huge change with the weather here. And as we start moving into spring, I want to put a challenge and I want to encourage you. If you are aware, and some of us are self-aware and some aren't, of a disadvantage in your life, do you think God can turn that into a blessing? Amen. Do you think Amen. that? Yes. Yes. Hallelujah! Amen. Our God can turn your disadvantage yes. into a blessing! Yes. Praise God! Yes. 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 I've been with Christian for 42 years. Amen. There was a young Cork guy who uh, gave his life to the Lord just about three weeks ago. I was talking to him up in the courtyard after the first service, and he was asking me about my story. 
And I said to him what I say here. For 42 years, since April <coughs> 1980, I have seen people with disadvantages turn their lives around and turn their children's lives around Amen. and their Amen. children's children because Jesus is now Amen. in the house. Hallelujah. Jesus is in their heart. Now there's hope. And that's what I want to look at today. So disadvantaged, are you? Yes, you are. Even if you don't want to admit it, we've all got something. But how can we turn it into a blessing? I am going to be looking at, uh, just throwing up the map here. You can see Israel in the middle. The blue bit is the water. Hello? That's the Mediterranean. And then you can see this place called Moab. It was a neighboring state of Israel. And Moab is what we're looking at today. It's just a few verses from the Old Testament. That is so applicable for you and me today. So we're going to look at the book of Judges chapter 3. If you really want to get the full benefit, read that chapter at home during the week. But I'm going to pick out just a few verses so that God can talk to you. And speak by the grace of God from his word into your life and mine. So, oh God, would your Holy Spirit start hovering over this hall? Would you walk up and down these rows of seats? And I pray you would give us a liberty Amen. to experience what it is to explore the goodness of God here today. Amen. Amen. The Israelites cried out to the Lord about their enemy and oppressor, King Eglon of Moab. So the Lord raised up Ehud for them. He was a left-handed deliverer from the tribe of Benjamin. He hid a sword and strapped it onto his right thigh. And he asked to see King Eglon alone. He then reached with his left hand and drew the sword from his right thigh, killing the oppressor. He then went to the hill country of Ephraim and he blew a trumpet declaring, Follow me, for the Lord has given the enemy into our hands. Amen. So the Israelites followed Ehud and they fought against Moab and they struck down 10,000 mighty Moabite warriors until not a man was left. Then the Moabite oppressors became subject to Israel, and there was peace for 80 years. Hallelujah. The word there is shalom, and it doesn't just mean there wasn't war, it means there was blessing upon blessing upon the people of Israel. We see at the beginning in verse 15 that the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of their oppressor. It doesn't matter about his name. But the Israelites had brought some of this trouble on themselves. And maybe you brought trouble on yourself. I, I, I pray with people with addictions sometimes. And when we're talking, they, they often say, I bought this upon myself. Do you know what? So did everyone. We've all brought trouble upon ourselves. Because of what we did or we didn't do, said or didn't say bad choices, but even though they bought it on themselves, look what they did. They cried out to the Lord. As soon as you and I cry out to the Lord, things start to change. Amen. Because Amen. God wants to see you and hear you yes. turning and saying, I can't do this anymore, God. Can you help me? Yes. It's not complicated, mm. no. but it is profound. Mm. So they cried out to the Lord about their oppressor. Hallelujah. And what happens, we see the Lord raised up a left-handed deliverer from them, for them, from the tribe of Benjamin, called Ehud. First thing is, it's God raised him up. You see, the book of Judges isn't about a judge in a court of law like we have today. Back then, a judge was a leader. That's what it meant. A better word is a leader. And the first thing any of these men or women God raised up in the book of Judges, the first thing is that the Lord raised them up. An anointing was on their lives. Do you think God can anoint your life? Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. God can anoint you. Hallelujah. God can raise you up for a purpose. Yeah. 
So the Lord anointed or raised up this guy. He was left-handed. And he was from the tribe of Benjamin. <coughs> Does that make a difference? You know what? If you're left-handed, sometimes it's a disadvantage. If you're left-handed here, whether you're using a scissors or playing a guitar, you're going to get to have to get a scissors or a guitar that is suitable for a left-handed person. Those of you who are left-handed know exactly what that's about. Can I ask, who here is left-handed? Would you put up your hand? A husband and a wife? Yeah. No wonder you're quite left-handed. I don't know, keep up your hands, I want to see your hands. Go on, own it, own it, be proud. Are you left-handed as well? I never knew that guy. Whoa, he gone. Tusan <laughs> Kitok. My goodness, so I can see left. Yeah, do you know what they say? Something between 10 and 20% yeah. of people are left-handed. Well, it used to be that if you were left-handed in Ireland or anywhere in Europe, in school, the teacher would force you to start writing with your right hand. Did you have that? Yeah. You did. So this is within living memory. There's people here. They forced you to use your right hand. So now would you call yourself ambidextrous? No. So you know, we lost your left-handedness. No, we're still left-handed. My mother went down to the north and threatened her. She threatened her. You see, that's what left-handed people were dealing with. You were different. You didn't quite fit in. And the culture was, you can't be different. And that is not in the Bible. Because God made us all unique. Amen. Amen. And God uses your unique gifting. Yeah. And all of us together mm -hmm. blend into something that only God can bring together. And we all bring something different. And Denise's grandfather, Timmy Desmond, was left-handed. And he was forced to use his right hand as well. But his mother didn't go down and threaten to beat up the dog. <laughs> He was a generation back again. They had to accept it, but of course he became what's known as ambidextrous. He could use his right and his left hand. And so here we've got a guy who's left-handed. Now you might say, okay, a bit of a disadvantage. Actually, it was a big disadvantage for him because the tribe he came from was the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin. It's on the territory of Benjamin is the city of Jerusalem, which is symbolic of the church. So we're talking about you and me. And the tribe of Benjamin meant son of my right hand. That's what Benjamin means. Son of my right hand. Historians, Jewish historians say the young men of Benjamin would go around with their right fists lifted up. Do you know the way where I live, hurling is a huge thing. And every young fella where I live will go around with a hurley on his shoulder. They don't even go to the shop without bringing their hurley, you know. It's like their, their statement that they're warriors. But the guys of Benjamin would lift up their right hand. But if you were left-handed, you didn't fit in. You were different. You were at a disadvantage. Different, don't fit in, disadvantaged. And this guy, Ehud, would have gotten this message all the days of his life until God raised him up, until the anointing came upon him. So in boxing, it's called a southpaw. And if, uh, if you ever watch a boxing match and the guy is left-handed, that southpaw can come up out of nowhere and really knock out the opponent. It's very interesting to watch. And in Irish, we call it a kitog. I was saying it to Aegon there, because um, he's, he's left-handed. And that's how you say it in Irish, it's a kitog. And in, originally in Ireland, in Ireland, if you go back to the Brehan laws, if you were left-handed, you were celebrated in this culture. Yay. You were seen as very creative. I always knew there was a creative thing. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I want you to put your... All the local court people are getting out of hand. Security. <laughs> trouble here up at the top. Get rid of them. This guy did not grow up in ancient Ireland. He grew up in ancient Israel in the worst place. The worst place he could have grown up. And he was a, a man 
who was well able to fight, but every time he went with the other lads, he knew he was different and didn't fit in. But God raised him up. And look at this fascinating verse 21. He got alone with the king, who was the oppressor. He was an obese, evil guy. And we're told he reached with his left hand and drew the sword from his right thigh and he killed the oppressor. Now if you go to any castle in Ireland or any medieval castle and you walk up the stairs, they go round and round, your right hand and your shoulder is going to be in by the wall. And that is deliberate because that is defensive so that any attacking army who come into the castle, they're mainly going to be right handed. But you got to be left-handed to keep your sword out. However, the guys who own the place will be coming down, and their right hand will be free, and they will kill the enemy coming into their territory. So everything is involved around right-handedness, but Ehud turned his disadvantage into an advantage. When he went in for this private viewing with the king, the security guys would have been looking at the left hand side of him because right handed people would take a dagger or whatever from their left hand. But he was different. And he changed that difference and turned it into a blessing. Amen. Now, don't come at me and say, oh, there's murder here, I don't believe in murder. Like, no, okay, that's the Old Testament. Okay, some are two or looking, one or two are really serious. God isn't asking anyone to go and kill someone with a dagger. Would anyone say amen? amen? Stop thinking about your boss. Or your teacher. No, this is symbolic for us today. The oppressor is the addiction. The oppressor is a broken heart. The oppressor is a depression. The oppressor is... I'm the wrong color skin, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too brown, I'm too black, I'm too white, I'm too bald, I'm not clever enough, I'm not good enough, whatever it is. He turned it around. Now who is your King Eglon? Who is your oppressor? Who is on your back trying to make your life into a life of bondage when really God wants you to be free? So the guy who was different used that difference and he slaughtered the one who was oppressing them. Not only that, Ehud built community. John Maxwell, the Christian writer says, if you think you're a leader and no one is following you, you're just out for a walk. <laughs> and I say it with respect, but I've met many, particularly men, who fancy themselves as leaders, but no one ever follows them, and they're literally walking around. Ehud built community, because that's what a leader does. A leader would always build community. A real leader is not me, 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 it's you, you, you. And if he's got a faith, it's him, him, him. It's Jesus first, others second, yourself last. J-O-Y, joy, joy. So Ehud build community. And we, we're told in verse 28 that he blew a trumpet. Don't you love that? Mm. All the theatrics. we got to get a trumpet coming. <laughs> Do you know what? we got to blow a, a trumpet boogle. in here. A boogle, whatever. <laughs> he blew a trumpet. He went up to the hills of Ephraim where lots of people could hear him. And he blew the trumpet. <laughs> and gets everyone's attention. And he says, follow me. See, someone has to lead. No, I believe we should all just wait. You'll be waiting. Someone has to lead. <laughs> follow me. The Lord, not me. See, he's not looking for his own glory. Have you ever come across a pastor who's always talking about himself and looking for glory? Run, run, because there's something really wrong with someone who's that egocentric. The Lord has given the enemy for us or to us. And so if you read in, the nation of Israel followed him and they slaughtered the enemy and they became free. Hallelujah. Amen. And they turned the tables and it all began with a kito, a southpaw, a left-handed guy with a disadvantage, turning it into his advantage and blessing his nation and his people because of it. And what I love what I really love 
and uh, we're going to, my granddaughter, my youngest grandchild is two today, we're going out after church to the party where we'll get loads of cuddles. <laughs> but, do you know, when, when you see the generations coming after you, it gives you a longer perspective, it's very interesting. And Ehud, this guy, what he did began to go intergenerationally, because many years later, and I pray this for my own grandchildren, their children, something happened. Look at the culture change. Judges 20, it's another 17 chapters later. We read there were 700 chosen warriors of Benjamin. All were left handed. And each could sling a stone at a hair, at a hair, and not miss. And that's a hair of your head, not the animal, at a hair. So, the tribe that had the culture that celebrated being right-handed, <coughs> totally transformed, so that anyone who was left-handed was obviously cherished and celebrated, and they could use their difference for their advantage. Now, you might say, eh, that's only just symbolism. Well, you're probably wearing an item of clothing, or an item of shoe wear, and it's got a label on it. That's symbolism, branding. Remember, the advertising industry will rob you of your dignity and sell it back to you at the price of the product. So I'm only cool if I have the right jeans, the right sneakers, the right top, the right perfume, the right haircut. I'm only cool if I drink the right coffee, the right beer, whatever it is. That's symbolism. Symbolism is all over sport or music. Symbolism is in nation states. We're going to put up the, the flag of Ireland throughout the building for our celebration in two weeks' time. We've got a national anthem. Even in the Christian church, we have symbolism. The breaking of bread next week, where we take the bread and the wine. When we'll be baptizing people at Easter in the pool. It's symbolism. If you were to wash someone's feet, it's symbolism of serving them and humbling yourself before them and looking to bless them. Symbolism is important and we are foolish if we don't see that. And so the symbolism of being different and being left-handed was transformed intergenerationally so that Ehud's children and his children's children and their children never had to suffer never had to suffer what he had suffered. Because God changes cultures. God changes families. God changes people. God changes you. Do you believe it? Yes. Even if your heart is broken, God will change you. God will heal your broken heart. If you're struggling with self-harm, or anxiety, or depression, or even suicide, God will heal your broken mind. And the God I know heals broken bodies. Amen. Anywhere Jesus went, there were miracles. Yes. Where Jesus is, there are miracles. No Jesus, no miracles. Yes, Jesus, yes, miracles. We believe in a God of miracles who will say Amen. Hallelujah. God did a miracle in the tribe of Benjamin and the one who oppressed them look at what it says in verse 30 he became or they became the subject and there was shalom for 80 years that's a long time so the ones who were oppressing totally flipped over and they then had to become subject to the ones who had become slaves. You see, you are the head, you are not the tail. That's Amen. what the Bible says. Amen. Now you can look at your disadvantage, and I quote this prophetically. Job's wife said, look at all this trouble in your life. Curse God and die. <coughs> Curse God and die. And some of us here have had a hard time, and we can curse God and die. That is your choice. But Job wouldn't listen to his wife. Sometimes we shouldn't listen to our wives. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I think you should ask for hands there, Tom. But usually we should. 
sometimes we shouldn't listen to our husbands. Yeah. But usually we should. Job's wife was so up to here with the sickness and the death and the poverty. She said, and remember, these are people dying. She said, curse God and die. But Job knew there was someone above him yeah. who was far stronger and yeah. far better yes. than his circumstances. Amen. Yes. And Job didn't curse God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Don't curse God in your life. Yeah. Don't say amen. Yeah. Yeah. Don't curse him. Yeah. No matter how much your heart is breaking. Yes. What did God do to Job? He restored. Yeah. Yes. He had lost children. God gave him new children. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. He had poverty. God restored his wealth. Amen. He had sickness. God healed him. Amen. The oppressor became the subject. Now I challenge anyone to take this book called the Bible. If you don't believe this, you're going to have to get a scissors, whether it's a left-handed scissors or not. And you're going to have to cut out most of the pages of this book because the central theme of this is how God delivers, how God heals, how God saves, how God restores, how God changes the fortunes of his people. Amen. Yes. And they had peace for 80 years. If you think you've got a disadvantage, you're in good company. The people who followed Jesus for the first few years were mainly Galileans from Galilee up north. According to the people of the time, they had a terrible accent. Maybe you're self-conscious about your accent or your voice. They were known as basically the rednecks, the country bumpkins, the backward ones. The Jews in the south, actually around Jerusalem, looked down on them. Because they weren't educated like them. They weren't sophisticated. The Pharisees and the scribes and the Sanhedrin. No, no, no. We won't have any Galileans. But I'm telling you, it's the Galilean genetics that changed the world. Amen. There was something about those who were on the edge. Who had the disadvantage. Who changed the world. They weren't educated, but they were educated in the things of God. Hallelujah. Amen. And a lot of them were extreme in their background. Matthew was a traitor. He worked with the Romans collecting taxes. Simon was a zealot. He was a fanatical freedom terrorist fighter, whatever word you want to use. What was in their childhood that caused them to go to those extremes? What kind of messed up thing happened that they would be so extreme in their lives? And yet, they are the people that Jesus raised up and he turned their disadvantage into an advantage. Amen. Can you imagine looking on at Matthew the traitor and Simon the Jewish terrorist and they would have killed each other a couple of years ago and together they break bread mm. and they love Jesus and they follow him because God, Jesus, used their disadvantage and turned it around. And their former disadvantage became like a witness to everyone looking on. Let me conclude with one final thought for you. And that is something very seasonal. We're about to celebrate the coming of Christianity to Ireland. When Ireland became the only place on earth where you could read the Bible. They copied it out in Latin, and you could read it in the monasteries here, when all over Europe, the Bible had been burned and was lost in the Dark Ages. And here, it all began with someone called Patrick. He was a foreigner, he was a slave, and he was a Christian. He was kidnapped and brought to Ireland as a slave. What a terrible disadvantage. But that teenage boy learned the language of this land. He became fluent in Old Irish. He was a slave, but he escaped. And God put it on his heart to come back here. And he came back. He had been a Christian then, but he came back and he brought the gospel to Ireland. And probably, other than Armenia, you're going to read of a nation that so wholeheartedly embraced the gospel. And one of the big things the Irish loved was that God was three in one. 
the Trinity. Yes. The Irish loved that. It was all in the folklore, all in the old belief system. It's like there was something subconscious that they knew God was three in one. And when Patrick said, Father, Spirit, Son, yes. they got it. That's what the shamrock was about, the three in one. They got it. And it all began with a slave boy, with everything against him. And God turned his disadvantage into such a blessing. So much so that you are seated here today to some degree because of a boy with all this disadvantage that God turned around. That blows my mind. That blows my mind. Because we as a church, we don't look to Rome for our inspiration, with all due respect. We don't even look to the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, for our inspiration. We look to the Celtic Christian Church here in this land and what God did here. Because that was astounding. And all over Ireland, tens of thousands of men and women were baptized in lakes and rivers and in the sea. And it was because of a young man with a disadvantage that God blessed the nation and through this nation blessed most of Europe, the known world then. So we're going to pray for your disadvantage and we're going to ask that God would show us for the month of March, this is the last Sunday in February, that God would give you evidence and give me evidence sometime in this month to come when we'll be fasting and praying as well and that we see the evidence of something negative turned into a blessing in our lives. Amen. Could the band come up? Especially something that's a disadvantage that maybe you've carried for a while. I'm going to give the opportunity after we sing this closing song to come forward and lay it out to the Lord as if bring it to the altar and lay it down. If you're self-aware of a disadvantage that you've got and you're going to pray that the Lord will take it. We're going to pray the month of March will be a month of clear evidence of something wonderful happening in your life. I really, powerfully, on fire in my belly, want to challenge you about the month of March. There's something happening. It's a time of change. And God wants to change something in your life. So Father, we give our lives as this week we come into this new month. And we pray now, Lord, as we leave this place, we will take something of the anointing, of the blessing that is happening here. Into our homes, who say amen? amen. Into our workplaces, who say amen? amen. Into our schools, who say amen? amen. And oh God, that your fire, that perhaps is just a gentle flame, would begin to burn and consume all that is evil, all that is disadvantaged in our lives, and that we would be more than conquerors, that we would be sons and daughters of the King. We give our lives, we give our prayers, and we give the month of March to you, praying that this time next month, we will have many testimonies of what you have done in our lives. We pray this for us and our loved ones, in Jesus' name, for the last time, the people of God said, Amen. Amen.